This is the Craft Beer Compass Podcast. I'm Joel Kennedy, and today I'm very excited about our featured guest, Greg Avola, co-founder and CTO of Untapped. I had this idea when we first started rolling some of these features, like Untapped would be your wingman when you go out for the evening. You can tell you where to go, where the hot, hot spots are, tell you what to drink in those hot spots, and it can tell you really uh, where to go next. So that's kind of the vision of what we try to do. If you're unfamiliar with Untapped, switch over to your app store, download the app, grab a beer if you can, and check in. You can share your beer experience with your social networks, and you can connect with the craft beer community that will soon number 1 million members. It's transformed the craft beer landscape and taken beer journeys to a whole new level, from discovering local beers and breweries and bars that are virtually, well, and oftentimes quite literally within arm's reach, to setting your sights on all that's out there just a little bit further than your doorstep. Listen in as Greg and I talk about the early days, current category leaders, and untapped features, and what lies ahead, both for untapped as well as where craft beer is going overall. So away we go. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the show, Greg. And if you would uh, just start off by letting people know, well, they know your name, but uh, (laughs) what your role is uh, with Untapped. Sure. Uh, My name is Greg Avola. I am the co-founder and the chief technical officer of Untapped. Um, One of the uh, we we started the company back in 2010 in October, and you know my primary role within the organization uh, is to really from the from the app development phase to all the way to the infrastructure. Uh, we're only a two-man team, so we're kind of small. So when you are this small, you wear many hats, but uh, my primary role is on the technical side. And it's kind of your, um, I don't want to say part-time job, but your second job, your your job of love. It's not your <laughs> full-time day job, right? Yeah, that's correct. So I actually uh, work full-time um, in another organization and uh, mainly doing web development um, and, uh, you know, I got into Untapped as kind of a side project, and you know, I always tell people that I'm kind of like Dexter in the TV show, so I don't kill anybody at the end of the day. I'm more <laughs> development work um, on the side, and it's actually helped me in numerous ways, kind of hone my skills around web development and around um, you know uh, the development processes. Because sometimes, you know, in a regular work setting, you might not tackle all the different uh, in, in infrastructure and technical things, and then you know, I go home and I'm tackling these different environments. So it's good for my you know, knowledge and increasing uh, my proficiency when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you can sleep when you're dead, right? Exactly. Well, I, I don't even know what that word means anymore. Uh, it, it's quite funny. I, I spend a lot of time uh, after after hours uh, and making sure that things are working appropriately. Uh, one of the funny things with a beer app is that most services that you deal with are kind of heavy during the, the day or, or the non-weekend period. But with Untapped, it kind of works out well because during the day, uh, no one's really drinking too much unless you're over in another country with different time zones. But then at night, I really can hone in on the on the environment and stuff and uh, make sure everything's working appropriately. So it kind of works out in that setting. I think we all aspire to have that job, though, where we can <laughs> drink during the day. <laughs> exactly. That's like a you know wish list kind of thing. So. Right, right. Someday. So mm-hmm. Untapped's only been around since 2010. How did it all come together? I mean, it just seems like the first time I heard about Untapped, it was this established presence, really strong brand. And to have that kind of equity at that short into your lifespan is, is pretty incredible. How did it all start coming together? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I, I started the company with my co-founder, Tim Mather, who lives in California, and I live in New York. Uh, and Tim and I have been friends on and off. To Believe it or not, we actually met each other over Twitter. Uh, I've known him for about five, six years now, working on some side projects here and there, some freelance before on tap uh, days. And, um, you know, he came up with, he, he called me one day in early July of 2010 and we were talking about the whole craze of the check-in so back then you know 2010 everybody was in doing check-in stuff there was koala there was foursquare you know at the forefront of that and one of the things that we loved about foursquare is that we were able to check into a location and then share with our friends 
But, you know, we found ourselves trying, you know, obviously saying, you know, what were you doing at that location? What were you, were you, you know, having a beer? What were you having for dinner? And, you know, those kind of questions become more and more prevalent. So we said, what kind of industries have this social aspect, uh, but never really an online presence with it? And there, and beer came to mind immediately for us because, you know, it's a very social activity, but it never was represented in a kind of a social network. Yes, there was beer advocate and rape beer communities, but never really a social network dedicated to exclusively beer. So that's kind of how it started. And, you know, I, I remember telling Tim when we first started building it, it's like, I think it's a cool idea, but I don't know if anyone's going to use it. Maybe our close friends or, or whatnot, but hey, it's worth a shot. And I was totally wrong with that completely. Um, so it was, that was a fun experiment, but, you know, we launched in 2010, since September, uh, and, you know, we've been slowly growing our, our application up and, uh, now we're up to around 850,000 registered users on the application. Uh, and we should have a pretty good success considering the size of our team and, and the fact that we're all both part-time on it. Yeah, that's incredible. It's definitely a short period of time, but it's been building and growing. Has yes. there been one definitive moment where you kind of sat back and realized like, hey, this is going to work or, or we're going to make it? I, I think that moment really became about a year into the application. Uh, we were starting to develop uh, our native applications. We were a mobile web app before we first started. Um, and as we transitioned over to more of a native format, uh, I walked into one of my local watering holes um, and I saw three guys at the end of the bar. And as I walked by them, they were all checking in on a tap and I had no idea who they were. <laughs> and that and that moment to me was like, wow, this is why we build what we build. This is what we're doing for. We're doing this to build an experience and a product for the community. And people were actually doing it. And that's kind of where it hit me and said, wow, this could actually work. Um, so that, that was a really cool moment for me. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. It's it's funny. I mean, you talked about rate beer and beer advocate. I remember mm -hmm. rate beer days. I used to that's that's kind of where I caught my craft beer bug. Mm -hmm. But I remember having my notebook and pen. So this was before, you know, mobile devices even right. became commonplace. And people just scrutinizing you and giving you these looks like what's this guy doing you know is he some <laughs> undercover like sleazy news reporter what's going on and you fast forward to even last weekend when i'm in a brewery and i have my phone out and a couple people come up to me and say oh you're on untapped what's your name this is my name let's link up it's it's incredible how far things have come or how much technology is changed that that social drinking scene yeah i mean it's really interesting and, and it's really the essence of why we continually spend so much time on this in our free time because we really believe in one the craft beer movement and and, and giving people the opportunity to discover and learn more about beer it's kind of the underpinnings of what untapped is all about is where you know we do do have a lot of features that kind of cater toward the craft beer uh, crowd but um you know a lot of users will check in their all their beers that they're having and using it to better understand different taste palettes out there what beers you might like that's kind of the whole goal because you know to be completely honest with you joel when i when i first started untapped i really didn't like beer too much i wasn't really into it uh i just kind of started my uh, craft beer revolution, I guess you could say. Um, but, you know, before on tap, I really didn't know too much about beer and I really didn't like it too much. And from the application and learning about um, what beers are out there, what beers match well with my taste, what my friends are drinking, that kind of got me into the setting and kind of learned uh, more about it. And I always say if it worked for me, it can work for anybody else as well. So <laughs> right. uh, that's kind of the goal of what we're trying to accomplish here. Right. I, I have yet to meet a person who's had a great beer experience and not been converted over. It's just, <laughs> if somebody says they don't like beer, they just haven't found the right beer yet or enjoyed it's, something in the right setting yet. It's totally true. I remember, you know, thinking to myself, I, I never really liked beer in, in general. And then I had my, one of my first craft beers I ever had was a uh, rare boss uh, oh, yeah. from brewery Ming on up here in the New York area. Uh, and you know, that's not really your typical entry craft beer at all. Uh, it's more of a Belgian strong pale ale. And, uh, you know, it's, it's got a lot of great flavors in there, but you just never know. I mean, I think a lot of times people are scared or maybe they're, they're not sure if they're going to like it. So they don't want to, you know, buy a beer at a bar that they won't, they don't like, and then what they're going to do with it. So, you know, I think having these experiences where you get to try something and, you know, see what your friends say about it, can kind of influence your decision to try something different. And it really only takes a couple and then you can really understand the taste and understand the beer and you pretty much convert it at that point. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So Rare Voss was probably your gateway beer, would you call that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I remember exactly where I was when I had it, what bar I was at. 
of course, obviously would no, all help to untap, for lack of a better word. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, that was it for me. I remember trying it, and I said, I didn't know beer could taste this good. And I think that's kind of the re reaction that a lot of people that are getting into beer for the first time have when they, they find a, a beer that they like. And hopefully, you know, we're able to help with that process to kind of tell you what beer you might like based on your previous check-ins that may be help you experience a little bit better. Yeah, and the recommendations that I, I'm pretty sure almost everybody listening to this podcast has used on tap, and if they haven't, they'll quickly become familiar with it. But when you check into a beer and you get those recommendations, they're pretty spot on. I, a number of times I'm like, yeah, I've had that one before. I just haven't, you know, I didn't have it before I got untapped. Or, right, right. You know, yeah, I just got to, I got to log that there. That's one that I'm hunting for. The The recommendations aren't out of the blue. Now, you from the programming side and app development side of thing, what's that kind of algorithm look like or what kind of information feeds into those recommendations? It's kind of our secret sauce in a sense of how we do that. But for, for uh, you know, a broad view of it, it's, it's pretty much based on a few key uh, performance stuff that we think better uh, links two beers together. Obviously, the number one thing is the style. So you'll see very similar you know, style beers recommended to the style you're drinking. And then secondly, we look at ratings, reviews, check-ins, uh, what your friends are having, and to kind of put all that together and make it into a little package for you to see what you've had. Also, the thing, too, is we only show beers that you've never checked into on tap before. Because if you recommend beers you've had before, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of kind of discovering new beers. Yeah. So that's one of the requirements we have with that. One thing we are working on now, and, and we're beta testing a little bit of it, is um, one of the problems, obviously, with recommendations is that you might get a recommendation for a beer that's not sold in your local area. Yeah. So we're trying to chew a lot of data together and get local recommendations that are available within your particular uh, location, which we think will be awesome and even better because it provides you with beers you can actually physically get where you are. Yeah. Sometimes you just don't get that experience. So we're working on that uh, as an upgrade in the future. I think that'd be perfect because, yeah, you do look at those and, and there's a number of ones that, you know, you could do the beer trades for them. And yep. if I look back, you know, five, ten years ago to get a lot of those beers or to get beers that weren't accessible, you had to beer trade for them. And right. it was time intensive. It, it was a little, you know, more costly to mm -hmm. ship and, and take a gamble on. Is it going to make it that right. now that there's so many options available locally for most markets, you don't have to go hunting for too many of those. And you know, the ones you want to go hunting for and the whales right. you want to catch, but yeah, there's, there's this huge range of options in so many markets now that that would be a huge resource. Yeah, and we've tested it pretty well with some some users, and and uh, we're getting really positive feedback. That was the number one complaint we got with the recommendation system. People loved it, but you know when we, we keep teasing them with get Planet of the Elder and they can't get it because they're not in three places in the country that has it, then you know people get pretty irritated and want to try something different. So we want to mix it up, and we want to be able to provide a more real time local um, kind of uh, recommendations that are available near you. So we're working on that. Hopefully, we'll get it out. When you guys rolled out the uh, the premium supporter feature, mm -hmm. well, that's probably less than a year ago, right? Yeah, it's actually a year ago today, believe it or not. Holy I don't cow. know how that worked, but it, it actually a year ago today we rolled out those features. Well, that's why we're doing the podcast, correct? Right? <laughs> I just, you know, I thought one year out, let's uh, let's there circle back with one of the founders <laughs> of Untapped and. Has um have have the people who have opted into that subscription feature enabled you to do enhancements like the recommended beers? Yeah, so you know one of the one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Untapped is that we are a, a self-funded startup and we're doing it on the side. So pretty much, you know, our nights and weekends are dedicated to make the best product that we can. So you know, there are many options we could have gone, you know, slapped ads all over the place, which I'm not a big fan of, or you know, uh, started charging every user, which also I'm not a fan of either. So we had an opportunity to allow users to you know donate or, or support us to keep our growth going and, and support our servers because you know if you're not into technology the servers that run untapped are pretty expensive and there's a lot of them to keep the service up and running so what we've decided to do is we wanted to give an option for users to donate but we didn't want to slap a paypal 
kind of donate button on our site. We wanted to give some features back to the users and, um, you know, in exchange for a subscription model. So um, we just recently refreshed our statistics page for supporters, which I love because you can now see, um, you know, where you've been on your untapped account. So it shows maps and stuff like that. So I have little pins of all the locations you've been all across the world. That's a great way to kind of keep track of what you've had in a more visual format. Um, and then some users like to do more enhanced statistics on themselves. So they, they'll be able to download all their data in Excel or JSON or XML and start to you know parse through that stuff on their own side. Uh, but you know the, the the funds that have come in from the supporter account have helped us really grow the service and add more uh, power, so we can do these kind of real time recommendations um, on the fly without crashing the entire server. So it's been a really big help to us. Yeah, it has seemed like there's been less uh, unscheduled downtime than yep. there was a year plus ago. Yeah, we, we, we struggled a little bit with that when we first started. Uh, you know, to be honest, I don't think we ever expected this kind of uh, attention or traffic on, on key nights. And of course, I'll knock on wood right now so nothing bad happens as we speak. <laughs> uh, you know, I, th I think what we've done is we've really focused really hard on making service as fast and as reliable as it can. Um, you know, bearing in mind what we have for resources and what we have for uh, you know, funds and infrastructure. We try to do the best we can. I think we've done a much better job over the last six, seven months than we have in the past. So we're really happy with, with that kind of experience. You said there are about 850,000 or so users of Untapped? That's correct. How about how many check-ins would you say there are a day? Uh, per, per day, it kind of ranges. It depends on the day, obviously, because, you know, we go to a Thursday, Friday, Saturday cycle. That's pretty high. We do have around 55 million check-ins in the system since the inception. So you basically have a lot of users that are very uh, active on the service um, and check in a lot. It's pretty funny because I did some analysis on some of the check-in data recently when I was trying to compare some of the top cities. And you know, when I pulled the data, I was pretty much uh, expecting the, the results that I got. You know, the, the top city with the most population got it. But comparing the unique user check-ins to the total check-ins, I found that, that um, cities that have public transit, like New York, Chicago, had a four-to-one ratio increase in <laughs> users per check-in than people in non-metro areas. So that was kind of, you know, I knew that was going to happen, but I, I, I could visibly see it in the numbers. So it was very cool to see uh, that kind of statistics in, in that light. Um, yeah, it makes total sense. It does. I mean, you know, you don't have to get into a car, and that's a good thing. You can stay and have another pint. So I think the list was uh, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, Oregon. Um, and my brain is kind of going out after that. But I think, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the big explosions that I've seen is the Midwest over the last, um, uh, over the last, like, you know, three to six months. Yeah. Uh, the Midwest exploded when it comes to beer. Uh, obviously, Chicago has always been pretty prevalent in that. It's a daily big beer, beer town. Yeah. But I think the Midwest, the central uh, part of the country, Kansas uh, areas, those are becoming more and more popular on the surface of what we're seeing. Yeah, Chicago has just exploded. And we're in yes. Milwaukee that we try to keep up with Chicago and make it down there a couple times a month. But it yeah. is just booming that when we started... Uh, visiting breweries, I started doing brewery visits with my oldest son uh, when he was born, and we would drive pretty much anywhere within four hours distance and just wow. go tour breweries and hang out together. And, you know, we were very responsible, but we got to <laughs> see a lot of places, and it was nice. But when we would go down to Chicago, it was just Goose Island there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Rock Bottom was there. Pete Crowley, who's at Haymarket now, was uh, the brewmaster at Rock Bottom. But that was kind of it. And now going down there... It's like pick which, you know, one of the 50 breweries you want yeah. to try to hit. It's it's impossible to keep up, which is great. I mean, it's it's terrible, but it's great. <laughs> it's a good problem to have. Exactly. I will say that, you know, I had a chance to go out to Portland, Oregon, which is an amazing town for beer because literally I'd pop up on the untapped app, try to see what's popular around me, and pretty much there's about 18 breweries within walking distance of each other. Oh. And uh, that's a pretty amazing feat. Obviously, being in New York like I am, we only have really one brewery that you can physically go in from a tap room perspective, just because of the pure space uh, situation here in Manhattan. Yeah. But, uh, you know, out there, it's just like, you know, more breweries per square mile than I've ever seen. It's, it's pretty crazy to see. Yeah. Oh, so looking back at the stats, mm -hmm. do you know what beer has the most check-ins? 
So yeah, I mean, I, I think this kind of goes back to what I what I was saying earlier about how Untapped itself is, you know, cater maybe toward the craft crowd, but it's also toward everyone who wants to experience beer and and uh, check in so like the top three che- top five checked in beers on tap as of today number one is bud light number two is guinness draft miller light is three um yingling traditional lager is four and course light is five and oh. probably most people hearing that are like wow i didn't really think those would be the top top beers but these are the beers that have been checked in the most uh around the entire sh- service and i think that all these beers encompass where the beer brewery industry used to come from or you know started from and a lot of people use these as you know their gateway into beer and then they try other things as well so that's that's kind of the 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 you know the the forefront of what we're trying to accomplish with the beer discovery and, and, uh, and beer education well, and they're the most accessible and that's another thing too yeah they're probably the f- first ones that people have had that if they're opening up the app they're like let's give this a shot i just had a course light why don't exactly. i put that in the system it makes sense yeah and then you look down the list too and the first kind of craft beer that shows up here uh we have sam adams um and then we also have uh, sierra nevada which is the seventh spot on the top 10 list um so you can see that that you know the craft explosion is, you know, is everywhere. There are obviously a lot more micro breweries than macro breweries, but I think you'll see these lists start to change over over the years as more people start to experience and try these things. I mean, like you said, the nail on the head, these are the most accessible beers, so those are going to be the most popular ones. But the real question is, as these smaller breweries start to grow and to expand more often, to distribute farther, you know, will they overtake these these big macro breweries? That's really the question. So if you look at it through a lens of highest ratings or higher ratings, do our uh, our beers uh, start to differ a little bit from the most check-ins? Yeah, so absolutely. I think, you know, what we do is we, we, we basically take a poll of all the data that have at least a thousand ratings um, in, in, the, in the system. And then you see really the kind of the creme of the crop. So, I mean, Heady Topper uh, being up there, 4.6 out of 5, which is amazing. Wow. Uh, Plenty of the Younger is up there. Uh, Kentucky Breakfast Stout, um, uh, Canadian Breakfast Stouts up there as well too. So you see a lot of stouts, a lot of bourbon stouts, uh, bourbon county stout as well as on there. Uh, and these are kind of the rare beers, as you would say, or the ones that you have a really hard time getting or pack a lot of alcohol. Usually that's kind of the trend that I'm seeing. It's like the higher the alcohol content, usually the higher the rating or the higher the the uh, the review is for that beer. So yeah. Um, there are a lot of different beers out there. I think that there's taste for everyone, but typically speaking, most of these higher percentage ones typically rank a little bit higher. Yeah. Now, I've noticed that uh, you guys have styles, or you classify beers by styles yep. on the app, and mm-hmm. a lot of them have some pretty clear portability over to like the the BJCP, the yep. Beer Jub Certification Program style guidelines, but there are some differences. What um What's the methodology or um, thoughts behind how you go about classifying beers? Yeah, so when we first started, we used an open source beer database, which had a kind of rudimentary style uh, listing, which we kind of uh, customized to what we needed. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people struggle with, and you know, we have uh, internal discussions with us all the time, it's like we want to be more compliant with BJCP and we want them to be the forefront. But to be completely honest with you, uh, the user base on tap is a mixture of both beer geeks, you know, newbies and everyone in between. And the style guys from the, the BJCP are very detailed, but I don't think that they'd be uh, very accessible to every single user on the, on the on tap. Yeah, definitely. So we try to try to break it down into more manageable or easy to understand parts. But we're still not here, there yet. We want to really break it down into kind of uh, styles and sub-styles because sometimes the user might know, might not know, this is an IPA, but it is, is it an American IPA, is it an English IPA, I'm not sure. And they categorize it incorrectly, which then kind of screws their recommendations. So we want to really break these styles down into more manageable parts that are easy to understand. So they started at a kind of a parent level and worked their way down. But the real, the, the, the thought process behind it is we wanted them to be at least semi-identifiable uh, as opposed to being very vague and small um, that I would understand, but maybe not a user would understand as well. So that's kind of the, the idea behind it. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. And there's so many, I, you talked about the the beers that are having that, the higher alcohol percentage are often yep. the ones with the higher ratings. And that's where you see the 
the style guidelines just being stressed to limits where i'm not going to say the styles are going to break but it certainly is causing a little bit of a schism between style purists and people who just want to have a good beer a unique beer sometimes that isn't like something that they've had before and that's what pulls it ahead as being a better ipa because it doesn't taste like the other ipas they've had so it's a fun battle to watch and and see who's commenting on how it tastes to style to who's just saying they like it for what it is yeah, and it's cool to see that interaction because, um, you know, on Untap, you have everyone from, again, the newbies to the expertise. So you get to see a whole bunch of people talking about beer in a different light. And they give people an idea of, you know, is it good, is it bad? I mean, what people are saying about it. And it's not just people that know everything and not people that, you know, just started. So you get that good mix. I think that's what makes it successful um, from a review perspective is that it's everyone's opinion and no one kind of outweighs each other. They're all kind of yeah, that is nice that it's that's solid regardless of if you have one check in or two thousand. Exactly. When you uh look at the data, are you able to tell what beers are on the uh the most number of wish lists? Yeah, so I pulled a list from there and I think the wish list feature is one of those things where uh it's 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 a great feature for users to kind of keep track of the beers they want, for lack of better words. So users can actually add a beer to their wish list, and then they can have it, and it, it removes them, it removes from their wish list. Uh, but they can re-add it whenever they want. So we took a, a stab in the last three months of what the top um, beers that have been added to people's wish lists are, and some of them are the, are the rare beers. Most of them are the ones that people add to their wish list, and they probably never get a chance to try. So. Things like Plenty of the Younger is on there. Um, obviously, only released you know once a year. Um, Plenty of the Elder is also on there in one of the top spots. But the number one beer that's been wishlisted the most and not had over the last three months is the Pumpkin from Southern Tier. Really, which I think it's an amazing, amazing beer. But I didn't think it was that, I guess, exclusive, or maybe people just saw it and haven't had a chance to try it yet. I yeah. think it's an amazing, amazing beer. It's a pumpkin pie in a glass. Yeah. I'm lucky enough to have that in New York very frequently. Um, but I was puzzled by that as the number one beer in the last three months that I wish listed and haven't had. In these these past three months, like heart of pumpkin beer season? Exactly. That's what I, you know, I, I, I didn't really understand that. But it's... Uh, Numbers don't lie, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think it was last year I saw a stat. I think it was after after pumpkin season. Something about Southern Tier selling more pumpkin last year than like the rest of their portfolio combined, uh-huh. or something drastic like that. I, I I can't be quoted on that, but yeah, yeah. it was it was a significant volume, and that's why they ramped it up again this year, is because the people want their pumpkin, and it's delicious, and it's affordable, and yep. it's yep, great. Babe. And it's readily available. That's why, to, to me, it's on the wish list means that people saw their friends checking in this beer and they wanted it and they, they couldn't find it or maybe they just stored it in their cellar to do a comparison against year. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, that and also the, it's Oak Age Compliment is also on this list. Huh. So um, it's they definitely did a good job this year, uh, Southern Tier, uh, on uh, promoting that beer. So Yeah. yeah. One of the other aspects of Untapped that, especially my uh, sons think it's cool, and and of course I think it's cool too, is the uh, aspect of badges. Right. How were those introduced, and how have they <laughs> changed? Yeah. So when we first started uh, with Untapped, we wanted a way to kind of, you know, celebrate you know different taste palettes and you know expanding your your vision and, and where you've been. Um, so we introduced these badges to kind of help categorize or track your your progress through through the beer world, I guess. So when we first started uh, with the badges, every requirement for these badges were were uh, one and done. So we had the first 25 badges you see on your badge list. Those were the original badges that we had when we started, and every single one of those requirements, with the exception of the uh, distinct beer badges, so like the 125, 50, those kind of badges for categorizing the number of unique beers you've had, were all one. And we, we thought that people would not have a hard time with those, like uh, Top of the Morning, which is drinking a, a, a beer before noon. We said, okay, maybe that'll be difficult for people to do. Well, we were wrong with that, so we had to change that pretty quickly to five different beers before, yeah, I uh, think I got that the, one pretty early on in my untapped career. Exactly. So we <laughs> kind of learn from the experience and learn from the user and learn how to make better badges and um, you know better requirements based on what the users were doing. Well, I think untapped is a very unique product in the, in the fact that most people don't have to develop or design an app. 
people that are drinking alcohol. So you have to actually make things a lot simpler as they go on throughout <laughs> the night. Otherwise, it makes it a little more complicated. So I, I don't think I've ever had a job or, uh, or any, any programming task to do that. So it's been really interesting to kind of go down that path. Um, but I, I will say that as, as it's grown, we've, we've, we've kind of developed a better badge system. The earlier badges are very difficult. You'll find badges there that are pretty much impossible. Like, um, you know, we have the frat party badge is drinking uh, three uh, you know, cheap light beers um, at a college, university. Huh. Uh, we figured that would be very popular. Uh, it really wasn't. It's very difficult to do that, um, especially for some campus campuses that are dry. Um, you know, and other things, uh, you know, that we've created as well that kind of have a really hard hardness to them um, that we've learned from and then made better throughout the system. So we try to stay less on the complex side and more on the ease of use. It, we find people don't really understand the badges or get them. It kind of ruins the experience. Uh, one thing that we've always done and we've always been proud of is that we don't actually tell you exactly how to earn these badges. We kind of let you kind of give you a little hint or kind of a, a big uh, hint in the, in, the, uh, in the app and we let you kind of discover on your own. Uh, some people like that. Some people don't like it. Some people want to know everything. You know, I attribute those people to like the ones that you know want to know the end of a story without reading the entire book yet. Um, so you know, we, we want to make it more of a fun and educational experience. So uh, that's kind of what we, what we uh, came out to do. Yeah, it's fun. I like that journey aspect of it. That's kind of what we're all about here at, at the Craft yep. Beer Compass headquarters. <laughs> Very nice. So what is uh, what's next for Untapped? Any uh, features you're able to? to clue us in on or are those uh, being well-kept secrets? <laughs> well, there are, a lot of them are well-kept secrets, but I will say, as I talked about earlier, the local recommendations is something that we're very, very uh, excited on. The early feedback has been amazing. I've been using it for the last couple of months. And, you know, I discovered beers that, that just came into the city that I heard about being in other areas and now they're here. And uh, that is what I, I, I want um, out of the app personally when I visit other, other towns to you know get recommendations around what's hot and local to that area uh, you're going to find our, our app our, our service and, and our platform going toward more local flavors and results because that's really what we feel the most value is from the user perspective now we have a check-in we have this social aspect of the app which is very popular people love it and we enjoy using it as well but i think we want to expand more into the into the beer finder world and being able to help people find and discover new beers that are locally available to you and we think with the data that we have we can really help you um, not only find the beer but also find the bar that is being served at and help you kind of uh, better uh, live through that life cycle and um, you know enjoy the rest of your evening i guess you could say I had, this, I had this idea when we first started rolling some of these features, like Untap would be your wingman when you go out for the evening. It can tell you where to go, where the hot, hot spots are, tell you what to drink at those hot spots, and it can tell you really uh, where to go next. So that's kind of the vision of what we try to do uh, for the future. It's like geocaching for beer. Exactly, right? <laughs> yes, every, you know, and being a data junkie like, I'm, like myself, I love seeing these trends. You know, you can tell exactly when the seasonal beers start to kick in. Uh, and, 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 you know, literally it's, you know, as a side of it, it's earlier every single year that I've seen on the tap, like pumpkin beer start going in the you know, end of August and even early July sometimes. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy to see these trends and stuff like that, um, based on this data, but it's very cool to see that and see what drives people, um, to go out there and, and experience beer in a new way. You know, one of the things that I've always thought really crazy is that the badge system we have and the partnerships we've done with breweries. Um, it really kind of makes a difference in, in their world because they're able to basically kind of sponsor these badges and push them out to these consumers. And the consumers look at them and not actually go and buy the beer for the badge. It's a really hard idea to kind of conceptualize, but, but users actually love to achieve these digital rewards and they're willing to purchase a beer because of it. So we found that that's a really good driver of people trying to be beer. So we'll put out a new badge for pumpkin beers, and all of a sudden, all the trending beers on tap are all pumpkin. So it's very <laughs> cool to see that. Yeah, that is really cool. There's um, there's features that I like a lot, too, that aside from just checking into a beer, if you look at venues, and some mm -hmm. venues will post their their wine and beer list on their website, and others will use, like, beermenus.com. Mm -hmm. But I find at least half the time that that information just isn't good enough. But if I go on to Untapped and I search by venue, 
then I can view all the beer check-ins that have happened over the last couple of weeks and get a pretty good idea of if we're going to be, uh, if we should arrive early or plan on staying <laughs> for drinks or if we're going in for dinner and then getting out of there and finding better beer. Right, right. It's actually, we developed a little bit of a, a new feature that's kind of been silently released over the last month, which kind of takes a better aspect into what we call digital tap lists. So um, we do a special algorithm on all the beers that have been checked in at a venue, and we're able to kind of give you more of a short, uh, short list appeal of what's actually there. You know, sometimes you look at all the check-ins that have happened there, and you know you think this beer is going to be there, but it really isn't. It kicked. Um, that's really hard to kind of to kind of delve into um, from a programmatic side. But we'll develop an algorithm to kind of rank beers based on how many times they've been checked in versus the time the last were checked in to get a better sense of where these beers are and whether it's there. So, so that's actually live on the app right now. Um, so we've been kind of pushing it out slowly, um, and uh, that's really you know kind of helped me get actual tap lists from places that I go all the time that I may be not close enough to get a real tap list. And, and you know, we're 90% of the time is pretty accurate and we're happy with that as we continue to, to build up the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. If you look at one of those lists and half of the beers look like they're worth going for, then then you know you that it's worth taking the risk. Yep. Is that feature available on the mobile apps as well as the website? Yeah, it is. So if you go into a venue page on the app, and there's a little thing called beer list on the on the right hand side, and there'll be a list of all the beers um, that we've run through the algorithm, uh, depending on whether the the, the place is a actual real uh, bar, because people can actually add their own um, like homes and stuff like that to Untapped. Um, we basically categorize them as such, and we rank them based on the order that they've been checked in and the distinct users that have checked them in. So oh, it gives cool. you a good idea of uh, what that venue is serving. With some of the features that you have right now and also upcoming on the local stuff, is there any um, sort of move to create any sort of local groups or local chat boards or local events, anything in the hopper like that? Uh, we haven't really talked too much about that. We have talked about potential, um, you know, collaborations and community projects um, to help kind of engage the community a little bit more. Um, but, you know, all of that's kind of uh, up in the air at this point. I think uh, we have kind of tossed the idea around of, uh, of messaging and stuff like that, um, but we're, we're not there yet. I think uh, we really want to focus on the local efforts and the local recommendations and then, you know, increasing the um, usability and friendliness of the app. Uh, if you've been using the app for a very long time, it's, it's a very, we think, obviously, I'm biased, but I think it's a very easy to use application, but we're getting a lot of feedback of uh, things to improve to make it a little more accessible. And that's probably what we'll focus on in, in the next iteration of it, to kind of slim down the fat, for lack of a better word, and make it really accessible, snappier, and faster. Yeah, every time that there's a, an update for the app, I always think, oh, I didn't think it needed much of anything. And <laughs> then you get the update, and it's it, it's never, like, earth-shattering, but you're always like, oh, yeah, that is a little better. I like that feature. Now I can yeah. tap the top bar, and it'll scroll up rather than exactly. having to double tap. Like, the, the, little, the little fixes you guys do go a long ways. Our mindset is that our job is never done. I think we can always make the app better, and there's always things that we can improve upon. Um, you know, and being so small that we are, we try to do as much as we can for getting a release out uh, every, you know, as quickly as we can. Um, but you know, ultimately, with so much going on, we try to focus on the right things at the right time. So you've noticed that over the past couple of weeks, we've rolled some enhancements up to our website, changing some fonts around, and a new header. So we're trying to get our website up to date with kind of our app features. So you'll see some of those changes in. in next couple of weeks uh we're just trying to, to improve and keep uh, building the service yeah well and it's understandable that it's always ongoing and it's a journey mm -hmm. itself i mean if people's beer journey just kind of stopped after they had <laughs> a beer they really liked and then they didn't do anything but drink that beer it would it, it wouldn't need a place to go but clearly that that discovery continues with your app and with the beers they're trying and the people they're meeting and the places they're going it goes on and on. So uh, I guess final question for you. If uh, if you could only have one beer for the rest of your life, <laughs> what would that one be? It's like the million dollar question. <laughs> I know. I, it, it's always nice being the one to ask it too. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've had the, the opportunity to travel a lot this past year um, and try a lot of different, different beers. And honestly, 
Um, it all comes back really to one of the first great double IPAs I ever had, which was Planet of the Elder. And I, and I think the reason why I say that is because, you know, a lot of IPAs and a lot of beers um, of that category, which is my personal favorite, um, you know, they do, do leave a dry, kind of dry, you know, taste in the back of your throat. Uh, and you really can't drink too, too much of them because of that effect. And with the Planet of the Elder, and, and it's just so smooth and one of the best easy drinking double IPAs ever. Um, so for me, if I could get a million cases of those and put them on an island, I'd be happy guy. Uh, and I think that's probably my beer, my beer of choice. Yeah, well, there's no shame in that. It kind of <laughs> helped define that style, and, and it still pretty much leads that style. Yeah, I mean, they do a really good job in double and in single. The Blind Pig from Russian River as well is very, very good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've been to a couple bars in Pennsylvania where they serve Russian River in Philadelphia. And if we see the uh, you know the tap handle or the or the next on tap to be one of these beers, a plenty or the a blind pig, you know we're just trying to kick one of the kegs to make sure it gets on. Uh, so it, it's one of those special beers to me. Yeah, well that's awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast, Greg. No problem. Happy to be here. And thanks for having me. Oh, it was a pleasure. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks so much to Greg for joining me and for Untapped. If we're not connected on Untapped already, send me a friend request. I'm at Craft Beer Compass so that we can see what each other's drinking and where we're drinking it. As always, I want to hear what you think about the podcast, so feel free to leave a comment on the blog. You can post a review for the podcast on iTunes. Send an email to me at joel at craftbeercompass.com. You can tweet at me at craftbeercompass, just one S, or like the page on Facebook. Also on Facebook, you'll see a new feature that we kind of soft rolled out over the last week, and it's a new way to submit a question for a Q&A podcast that we do for our Start a Week podcast at the beginning of every new month. There's still the option to click on the tool and write in a question, but if you're feeling a little bit adventurous, you can click on the option to leave a voicemail recording, and then we'll be able to play you reading the question on the podcast episode and hear your question answered. Pretty cool. So maybe to incentivize you to use that option, how about we'll pick a winner of whoever does a recording and gets their question played on that episode. We'll give a free Craft Beer Compass snifter away to that person. In the event you want to get your hands on one of those snifters before the January episode, since we'll only be picking one winner, we do have some available for sale if you happen to be a subscriber of the Mileage Report, which is our monthly newsletter. If you're not a subscriber... Just go to craftbeercompass.com, subscribe, and then you're eligible to purchase one of the snifters. We have a lot of great guests and a lot of great beers coming up over the next couple weeks. I'm really excited for them. So until next time, here's to you and yours. Cheers.